All right, class, we are back, and we're going to be talking about the junctional rhythms. And so I kind of want to explain the difference between that and the the sinus rhythms and, and some of the differences that you're going to see. So back into reading these old EKGs here. And so the thing that I want to stress first and foremost, and bring my pen up here, um, the thing I really want to stress is, is this guy in the junctional rhythms now becomes the the primary pacemaker. So that's the good news, and it's still going to send out the electrical signals in every which way but loose. It's going to send out the electrical signals through here, the here, to here. It's all going to propagate through there. But, and then along with that, it's still going to propagate the signals down through the bundle of hiss, down in the left right uh, bundle branches, into the Purkinje fibers, which is then going to cause your muscle contraction. Here's the major difference, though. The major difference is, is that, again, it's starting there, and so we're going to have a difference in the P wave. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of a, a really important part. So we were talking about lead two. Again, in lead two, we all know that the normal electrical flow is, again, starting from this guy right here, going down through the internodal pathways in which they collect at this spot. In a junctional rhythm, folks, uh, there's a major difference. This guy is now taking over as your main, okay? He's your main guy now, okay? He is the primary pacemaker. So and we're going to talk about some of the differences with the rates in, in, in which they go. Now, so with that being said, let's let's move on to, to some of the rhythms that we're going to get with this. The biggest thing that you're going to see with a junctional rhythm is the inverted P wave. And stop and think about it. If if I've got my negative down here and i got my positive down here, and the signal is coming from there, and by the way, the rest of this is my heart, uh, again, you're going to see some signals going this way, some signals going that way. So the P wave is actually going to be flipped because it's moving towards this negative pole instead of towards this positive pole. So that's why it's going to be inverted. Now with that, I imagine you could probably surmise, not only is it going to be here, but that PR interval is going to be short. Okay, It's not going to be um, as long as, as it was. So again, we had 0 0.12 to 0 0.20. We were talking about a sinus rhythm. That was your PR interval, okay? This PR interval is not going to be that. This PR interval is going to be less than 0.12, okay? So it's going to be less than for a junctional rhythm, okay? So, in other words, it's going to be three boxes or less. Now, let's take that a little step further. So not only can we do that, the, the step further to this one is, is, well, matter of fact, sometimes the P wave just will get buried in the QRS, so we won't see a P wave at all, okay? So in this type of rhythm, you, there's either no P wave or it's inverted, okay? And every now and then it'll actually, you know, like pop up like right in the middle of this area right here. So again, we don't see it. Now, click it on here. Uh, so again, it can be hidden, it can be moved. Or even worse yet, it's actually behind the QRS complex. So we can actually see it behind that. Um, that's kind of a rare thing I'm going to tell you right now. Unless you got some major atrial enlargement, most of the time you're not going to see the P wave after your QRS. So, But understand you could see it that way, so let's keep that in mind. Now the first thing is, is we have a premature junctional complex. Now, guys, this one's usually kind of what I call an add-on. A, a, a premature atrial complex is an add-on. I have a normal sinus rhythm with a premature atrial complex. In this case, it's the same thing. Premature junctional complex. Now, when we had a PAC, we talked about that it was a P wave and it was upright. With this guy, it's either not going to have a P wave or it's going to have an inverted P wave, okay? Because, again, the signal is coming from, let me find my marker here. My, the signal is, again, coming from this guy. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to have retrograde conduction. It, it's going to be going backwards, okay? So if it's going to be going backwards, all right, 
So again, the regularity kind of depends upon the underlying arrhythmia. Uh, I will tell you that uh, it's actually, for the most part, usually regular. Uh, but the P wave, again, the key thing here, will be inverted, all right? Or it's not going to have a P wave at all. Again, the, the, the PR intervals are, are usually less than 0.12 seconds, if it's even there. And the good news is your QRS, it stays the same at 0.12 seconds. All right, so let's go a little bit here. This is an, an example of a premature junctional contraction. Guys, remember when we were talking about premature atrial contractions? That would have kind of a funny P way, and then it would have its QRS, and then a T. But notice, there is no, no, no premature... There is no change. There is no P wave in here at all. Now, one other little cool thing, if it was premature, so if we do the R to R interval here, it's okay. If we do the R to R interval here, it's the same. We do the R to R here, but the R to R here is not going to be the same. But notice, and this is what we call the compensatory pause. By the way, our PACs had this as well. Your heart kind of went, Poop. Oh, wait a minute, I don't understand. Oh, let me take a second here to reset. Oh, I'm going to kick back in. And this is our sinus node kicking back in. Everything's good. It's just we had the one funny little beat, okay? Again, nothing to be... And by the way, usually most of the time, guys, these are, are very benign, okay? It will make some irregularity of the heart. That's about all that it does. It makes your, your pattern a little bit irregular. Um, it, again, usually not malignant in nature. So now a junctional escape rhythm. All right, so when that SA node, which is that higher pacemaker, it normally goes between 60 and 100. And again, that's fine, except for what happens when it decides not to work. So back to the rod, the, the rod in charge analogy. Um, the rod in charge analogy says, hey, the SA node's going to beat. They'll, he's going to give the orders to the guys down here. The guys down here send the signals down. Well, rod's on vacation. So guess what? He's not here no more. So where is the signal coming from here? Again, our rate's going to be, and this is the key thing here, 40 to 60 a minute usually. Okay, and again, it's usually, everything's regular except you've got an inverted P wave usually when you're talking about this one. So again, 40 to 60 beats a minute. Um, usually it will be inverted, the QRS complex, but everything else is usually normal. Except for, again, your PR interval is going to be shorter, okay? The P wave is either going to be missing or it's going to be inverted, all right? So let's take a look. So this right here would be a junctional escape rhythm. Notice I still have a narrow complex. I still only have three little boxes down here. Not a big deal, but notice how I don't have a P wave at all. So there's no P, or even I could have one that might have a, a P wave like so. So all of these things you could see with a junctional escape rhythm. Key thing here, 40 to 60 beats a minute, okay? And then the P wave is either short, sorry, not short, but inverted, or we got no P wave, okay? Or no P wave at all, all right? Keep thing to think about there. Either no P wave, but everything else, if you had to put a P wave in front of this, you would be thinking sinus bradycardia. But again, no P wave. Guess what? It's junctional. Now, it's nice and narrow, by the way, so we know it's still coming from above the ventricles. Remember that that is where it's leading from. All right. So not, not to confuse you even more, so... Let's say that we have a really hyperactive, really supercharged um, uh, uh, junctional rhythm. All right. Matter of fact, kind of, there was a mess up on this slide right here. I can tell you what that mess up is here. So again, the AV junction, um, if it goes, the only difference between a junctional rhythm and accelerated junctional. So what the slide says right here, guys, it says 100 to 180. That is wrong, 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 wrong. So if it is 60 to 100, then it's going to be an accelerated junctional rhythm, all right? So the only difference between a junctional escape rhythm and an accelerated junctional rhythm is the speed that it's going. All the other rules that you just learned for a junctional stays the same. 
The only thing is, is instead of Rod's still on vacation, he's gone. He ain't making no signals. None of the rest of the atri is making any signals. So the lead instructors are going, but now the lead instructors are going like jackrabbits. Okay, so 60 to 100 beats a minute. That's all the difference is here. Again, everything is short, just like it was before. Notice no P wave. Uh, matter of fact, we might. Matter of fact, I would say that we actually have probably the P wave. Maybe. Maybe is actually coming in right back here, like it shouldn't be. Okay, so notice there is no real PR interval that I can see, but our my rate is sixty to a hundred. I'm going to stress that again. Sixty to a hundred is accelerated junctional. Now, what we call it now, technically they say, well, Scott, that would be junctional tachycardia. You're absolutely correct. It would be junctional tachycardia, but we got something else that we're going to call junctional tachycardia, which is this guy right here. So the difference here is, is that the rate for junctional tachycardia, this is the the AV node on crack. Okay, he's moving and he's moving pretty quick. All right, all the same rules apply. Again, no P wave. Again, no the different narrow complex uh, for the QRS, but Again, if it has a PR interval, it's going to be less than 0.12 seconds, and the P wave is going to be inverted if we see it. Okay, so we might not see this one. So I get back out here. Whoa, wait a minute. Look at that. I got a nice, nice, beautiful inverted P. There we go. Another nice inverted P. Another nice inverted P. And look at the short PR interval there. And again, if I start counting this as two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11. Got a rate of 110. So my rate on this one is 110. So junctional tack, all right, is 100 to 180. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, I don't think you're going to ever, you're going to very rarely see junctional tacks at 180. Very rarely. Usually around 110, 120 is where you're going to see these guys. So accelerated junctional, again, 60 to 100. Junctional, the junctional escape rhythm, that guy's going to be 40 to 60. Okay, there you go. So this is normal. Yes, technically is this a tachycardia for the junctional rhythm? It is, but that's why we call it accelerated junctional. Okay, that's why we call it that. Now, again, notice the nice slender QRS complex. We're good with that. We actually kind of like that. Supraventricular tachycardia. Now, we talked about this a little bit in the atrial rhythms, and it's, and it's actually a phrase to describe the rapid, regular supraventricular rhythm that identifies because we can't see the P waves. Okay? So, it's kind of, I call it a scapegoat. Um, because you, oh, it's narrow and complex. We can't really tell if it's P's. Well, let's just call it supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, I kind of cringe every time I hear it, but it's, that is true. Because stop and think about the things that can cause a tachycardic rhythm. Okay, so these are a good little little notes to make here. Again, sinus tax 100 to 160. Atri is 150 to 250. Well, those kind of overlap. And so does atrial flutter. And so does junctional tachycardia. So how do I tell the difference? Again, this one here, I can see the P waves. And it's usually not above 160. Atrial tachycardia usually is, and that's the one that, that, that people kind of get mixed up on, especially when it's in the range of 150 to 160. So do I call it that? Do I not call it that? So they kind of take the chicken term out and they go, well, that's SVT. Uh, well, no, let's not do that. Um, again, I would feel you, you guys would be perfectly okay at 160 to say this is atrial tachycardia. Um, now, where does this become kind of important is when we start treating it. That's where it really becomes important. So sinus tachycardia, by the way, we fix the underlying cause. What's causing the heart to race? Atrial tachycardia requires a reset, whether it be a denison or something to slow it down or, in the severe cases, cardioversion. Again, very severe cases. Usually a dose of a denison, boom, works really good for these guys. But sinus tack, by the way, 
if I give them a fluid bolus, usually you're going to see some sort of reduction uh, or if you fix the problem. If you fix hypoxia, if you fix, uh, you try a fluid challenge, uh, you can pretty much rule out really quick whether or not it's sinus tack or atrial tack. And if this starts to slow, atrial tack, remember guys, will not slow, okay? It's not going to slow down. This guy is going to slow down if you start treating it correctly, all right? The atrial flutter, that all depends on conduction, and usually we can see the flutter waves. And then junctional tachycardia, we don't see any P waves anyway. So, again, if they're symptomatic, then yes, we would probably have to do a reset on that. Okay, again, if it's above 150, again, uh, we could use an adenosine dose. Adenosine is going to stop the SA node. It also stops the AV node. Okay, it basically causes a brief period of asystole. Now, this chart here is actually pretty good. Um, and I would probably kind of fix that to my memory. And again, atrial tack, atrial flutter. If I see the flutter waves, I can kind of pick out the atrial flutter. Junctional tack is a little bit harder again. I don't have P waves, okay? I don't have P waves. Here, they're just too fast to see usually. So if we can slow it down, and usually a dose of adenosine will allow us to do that, and it does it pretty safely in order for us to do it. Uh, again, the key thing is here, guess where uh, probably 90% of our tachycardia is fall? You guessed it, right in that range. So how do I tell the difference? Again, I could take a look at a 12 lead and see if I'm seeing P waves that I didn't see with my lead 2 camera angle. That's a good way to check it as well. Do I have lead 3 maybe, lead 1 where they've got upright P waves versus I don't have them in V1, V2? That would be a good way to tell. But again, sometimes they're just too fast. We just can't see them. We slow the heart rate down. And again, usually it's the first. our first line of that is to use some sort of, of adenosine to, to stop the heart. And then as it restarts, we're able to see those P waves QRS before it gets too fast. The other way is to use a rate control drug, using a cardizem to slow it down. Here's the problem. Cardizem don't really, it sort of kind of works on this. Cardizem actually works fairly decent on this guy right here. So we, we kind of like this one actually with Cardizem. Uh, and then junctional tachycardia, the, your problem is, is you're kind of slowing down that junction area. Uh, and again, junctional tach usually, um, usually kind of resolves on its own most of the time. Usually you, you find where the problem is, uh, you treat the underlying cause of this, hypoxia, hypovolemia. Most of the time, these guys reset just like a sinus tachycardia would. All right, so the rest of these are practice strips. So I know I went a little bit long on this one, but it's really important to understand the junctional rhythms and, and where we're at. And, and as we start to practice, you'll see the difference with those. So I'll see you guys on the next video.